I want to talk today about sex and violence, two behaviors that, in my opinion, are quite obviously overlapping in many respects. Now, one need only look at our advertising industries, our culture, Hollywood and the like, and what we are bombarded with day in and day out is sex and violence, sex and violence, and more sex and violence. Now, remember that these are both behaviors that society wishes to repress in various ways, violence for obvious reasons and sex for more subtle reasons. But the inundation we see in our society of sex and violence is certainly not a result of some recent conspirators aiming to destroy the cultural fabric of Western civilization. Lest we forget the bloodlust of the Roman Colosseum, there were, after all, no Illuminati or Marxists manipulating them. The reason for the presence of so much sex and violence in our culture is because we as human beings have an obsession with these behaviors. We have a fascination with serial killers. We have a fascination with sex and and quite often, our obsession between these two archetypes are blurred and melded together to the point that we can't distinguish between the two. And the reason for this is because both sex and violence are to some degree inextricably linked in the human brain. I'm convinced of it, and I believe that this statement will be validated as we gain further understandings of the human brain. Much like breathing is voluntary and involuntary simultaneously. And what I mean by that is that one can both voluntarily stop breathing and will involuntarily resume breathing eventually. I believe that neuroscience will determine conclusively at some point in our future that sex and violence are interpreted perhaps separately in the brain at times while being inseparable from each other at other times. Now, any neuroscientists, amateur or credentialed, are more than welcome to provide input in the comments section in regards to any studies highlighting similarities between neural activity present during violence and sexual activity. But one peculiar study that caught my attention uh, was conducted at the California Institute of Technology under the leadership of neurobiologist David J. Anderson. Uh, this was a study on mice to determine the exact neural cells responsible for aggression and sexual behavior in mice, where the ventral medial hypothalamus being previously isolated as having involvement in sexual and violent behavior was examined more closely to determine the exact areas responsible for the indicated behaviors. Now, the experiment was as follows. A male mouse was placed in a cage with either another male mouse, which he would attack, or a female mouse, which he would attempt to copulate with. Now, the problem with previous studies was that when using magnetic resonance imaging to study which parts of the mouse brain were active, feedback would be given in voxels depicting brain activity with each voxel representing millions of cells. A different method in this study was used measuring the presence of a particular protein that rapidly synthesized following neuronal activity. And this, this allowed the researchers much more accuracy in terms of isolating precisely which cells were active during the behaviors in question. And what they discovered was that a subset of the ventral medial hypothalamus, specifically the ventral lateral region, had cells that became active during both copulation and male versus male confrontation with about a 20% overlap. And it was also discovered that cells that trigger a violent reaction were transitorily excited leading up to sexual activity and then suppressed. So there's a complex relationship going on there in the murine brain. And this is in mice, not humans, of course, but these are the first indications that these primitive desires are somehow linked in mammals. And the reason I'm bringing up sex and violence is to highlight a concept, a theory, if you want to call it that, that most of us just don't want to truly accept. That is that sexually dimorphic species, including humans, are in constant intraspecial gendered conflict with each other. What is currently unfolding between men and women is a manifestation of a natural conflict that precedes our very own species and dates back to the first appearance of the male and female distinction between organisms. This realization on the part of the human being is part of our development of what I call reproductive consciousness. What do I mean by that? Let's ask ourselves, when did human beings first make the correlation, not on an instinctual level, but the actual correlation between reproduction and sex. The difference being a lion will kill a litter of young produced by a male rival in order to coax the available females into estrus, but he isn't consciously doing so in order to reproduce. This is a process driven by instinct, and even our somewhat sentient primate cousins probably only have sex because it just feels good to them, not because they understand the correlation between the sex act and reproduction, and certainly not because they understand the process of gametes being fertilized. It is human cognition only that has achieved reproductive consciousness, 
which I define as the act of being conscious of one's own method of reproduction in the biochemical and physiological sense. Uh, there have been other primate species that have been taught to trade money for sex, for example, but only humans have actively sought to engage in sexual activity with the express purpose of deriving recreational sexual satisfaction without pregnancy and in attaining our reproductive consciousness. We then, as a species, immediately set out to divorce the sex act with the act of reproduction, and this was not only inevitable but completely normal human behavior. Uh, we can go back thousands of years all the way back to the ancient Egyptians and discover historical artifacts like the, uh, and I don't know if I'm pronouncing this correctly, the Cahoon Gynological Papyrus, which gives instructions on various methods of contraception, and every great civilization since has attempted to devise methods of controlling fertility. The Greeks and Romans used Queen Anne's lace as a contraceptive as well as silphium to induce menstrual discharge. Now, in achieving our reproductive consciousness as a species, it was only a matter of time before we also discovered a transactional and adversarial quality surrounding our reproduction befitting exactly what one would expect from a sentient, sexually dimorphous, intelligent ape. Uh, the more control we gain over our reproduction as a species, the more we ameliorate the necessity of this conflict characteristic to sexually dimorphic species. What I'm attempting to describe here illustrates a hard truth that humanity must accept if it ever is to progress. That is, that it is extremely difficult, perhaps impossible, for men and women to ever act in synergy and unison with each other, it's only probable that we can work in cooperative mutual exploitation. The age-old term, battle of the sexes, arose for a reason. We are not and never will be partners. We are adversaries that are placed in a constant tug-of-war that exists for the purposes of replicating our species. Individual men and women rise above this and find commonality where they can. But our species, male humans and female humans, are pitted in a ruthless, unfeeling, calculating game of natural usury against each other, and the sobering reality for a sentient ape capable of developing alternative means of reproduction is that this gender competition is winnable, meaning one gender can actually conclusively lose, permanently. Now, it is within this context of potentially beneficial but adversarial gender mutual exploitation of the sexually dimorphous human ape that we can explain outside of the distractions of gender politics on the periphery of this conflict. Uh, we can explain a great many human sexual behaviors, particularly the various forms of sexual taboo inherent to human sexuality. But let me first discuss further the nature of this adversarial posturing occurring between the male and female of our species. Now, the human female is jealous of the fact that men are, you know, let's face it, endowed with a better ability to divorce logic and emotion, a better ability to understand complexity, superior strength, and the ability to enforce his will and desire on the environment around him. The male, on the other hand, is jealous of one thing, uh, her sexual power, her reproductive endowment. This is the genesis of the rape and domination fantasy that's so prevalent and popular amongst men and women. The breaking of the rape taboo in the context of the reenactment of rape within the setting of a consensual sexual fantasy is an expression of our attraction and repulsion to the opposite sex. The man, no matter how suave and smooth he may think himself, must at some point place himself at the mercy of the approval of a woman. She decides to allow him access to her. Him, the creature that split the atom. And yet here he is at the whim of some woman, at the mercy of her validation. He hates her for this, and he loves her for this. At least, at least neurochemically speaking, he does. During the sex act, however, the man can quell his rage. He can grab her by the neck. He can, you know, pound her into submission, pull her hair. He can handcuff her, whatever. I mean, she can't even deny that she likes it. During the rape fantasy... She has her power taken from her, simultaneously by force and willingly. This reproductive power is a power she undeniably inherently possesses and feels unworthy of having. She wants you, the man, to take her sexual power away from her, albeit temporarily. You see, in the haze of sexual euphoria, it's yours for the taking. 
in the civil capacity. She wishes to wield this sexual power with absolute authority and impunity. It is, after all, the single source of power from which she derives her sustenance. Of course men will only be given access to it during sexual reverie. It's like knowing that Francium-215 could possibly have amazing and unique chemical properties and trying to study it during its 8 nanosecond half-life. And it's with that said that I want to briefly talk about a book called My Secret Garden, Women's Sexual Fantasies, written by Nancy Friday which is a collection of fantasies shared by anonymous women that we can use to gain valuable insight into how the sexual fantasies of the female tie into this conflict dynamic of the sexually dimorphous human ape. Now, I found the excerpts on the rape fantasy bears mentioning here. The rape and domination excerpts follow a predictable pattern, which is a loophole around female sexual guilt and the demotion of the men involved to the role of sexual animal, all revolving around a power exchange involving the man taking female sexual power away from the woman. Friday writes herself of the rape fantasy, quote, Rape does for a woman's sexual fantasy what the first martini does for her in reality. Both relieve her of responsibility and guilt by putting herself in the hands of her fantasy assailant. By making him an assailant, she gets him to do what she wants him to do, while seeming to be forced to do what he wants. Both ways she wins and all the while she's blameless, at the mercy of a force stronger than herself. The pain she may suffer, the bruises and indignity are the necessary price she pays for getting the kind of guiltless pleasure she may be unable to face or find in reality." End quote. Now this elucidates succinctly the method by which females passively express their agency, with an emphasis on the expertise with which they weave all manner of plausible deniability in regards to her indulgence in what she or society has informed her to be taboo behavior. Uh, this line in particular bears repeating. Quote, By putting herself in the hands of her fantasy assailant, by making him an assailant, she gets him to do what she wants him to do, while seeming to be forced to do what he wants. This, gentlemen, cannot be emphasized enough. This is the dynamic by which women achieve lighter sentences for crimes ranging from petty theft to the most brutal psychopathic murders. This is how they compel men to employ violence by proxy on their behalf. This mentality, coupled with their biological neoteny, allows them to wield tremendous power over men, while putting the blame for any misuse of that power squarely back on the shoulders of men. It's, it's imperative that we understand this. Now, this is written from the perspective of a white woman, the racial fantasy being directed at black men in this case. And I, I love that this particular fantasy is mentioned because it, it provides to us a glimpse into how gynocentric thought so often intermingles with racism. Now, let, let's first take a look at what's written by the author, and, and please excuse the sexually explicit language, uh, but we're all adults here, and this needs to be explored. Friday states, quote, the black man is cut out for sexual fantasy. Everything about him, real and imagined, throws fuel on the fire. He's forbidden because of his color. His cock has been endowed with mythic proportions. And the story's been around for years that his expertise at fucking comes close to black magic. End quote. Now, intelligent black men, don't be fooled by this disingenuous sycophant. Women like this do not... L listen to me. Women like this do not see you as human beings. They see you as a kind of intermediary between a sexual tool of violence and an animalistic monkey. And understand that this is thinly veiled, racist gynocentrism disguised as flattery. Don't let your need for female validation disguise the fact that women such as these are some of the most vile racist round, and even, I dare say, the progenitors of the modern American false rape accusation that white and black women and women of all races wield against men today of all racial groups with legal impunity. Their sexual preference for you, intelligent black man, if you're listening, is inextricable from their inability to perceive you as a viable human being, and their desire for you is rooted in their racial daddy issues. Now, what do I mean by this? Well, again, I make the claim that women see men as either automatons or authority figures, or both, but never, ever as human beings. They base their entire existence relative to what men are doing to them, Men are the doers, they are the reactors. Women, like all human beings, are subject to the forces of national, cultural, and racial tribalism, and the emulsion of racism and gynocentrism appears when a group of women identify strongly with the men in their racial group. 
interracial sexual attraction between the sexes exists, it always will, and always has, although the reality also exists that in the majority, humans tend to reproduce along their own racial lines. So the optimal scenario would be a society that does not discourage or encourage interracial reproduction, but allows it to exist at the natural frequency that it appears in society. Instead, what we tend to do is to place a taboo on this behavior, and women then perceive the breaking of this taboo as a way to get back at the men who they identify racially with, whom they resent for placing these restrictions on their sexuality, or at least they perceive as placing those restrictions on their sexuality. It's essentially a form of getting back at daddy with the bad boy. In this case, uh, what these women perceive to be racist white men are the daddy, and what these women perceive to be animalistic black men are the fantasy. But this phenomenon certainly isn't unique to the white race. I've seen this happen. I've seen this phenomenon occur frequently in a cross-racial line. Now, I've had both black men and white men threaten to, to literally fight me for taking what they referred to as, quote, their women. Uh, these weren't women they were dating or involved with in any way, and race was never discussed between myself and these women. But this particular variant of racial white knight insisted on rescuing these wayward women from the dangers of evil interracialism. And make no mistake about it, although they must have been cognizant of the fact that I didn't force these women to take interest in me, I was considered by them to be the one at fault for sullying the honor of their precious white and black goddesses. And I've seen this again in every culture. Now, my school, uh, my university where I go to school is about 25% Asian. Many of my white friends uh, dated Asian girls. And, and the vitriol and hatred you saw coming from Asian male students on campus in regards to this, and, and even some of these Asian girls' parents uh, who, would, who would periodically come on campus was, was honestly quite disturbing. Uh, for those of you that think that all racism stemmed from the evil white devil, I'll be the first to tell you uh, that the type of racism that I saw directed at white men for dating Asian women uh, the underhanded, sneaky, just-below-the-surface nature of it all, I'd prefer the most in-your-face, unapologetic, racist white or new Black Panther Party acolyte over that kind of racism any day. But my point is that it occurs within every racial group. Now, you can look at both the American white and black nationalist groups and see how they despise, quote, race traitor women, and how it's always another group of men to blame for their women's interracial transgressions. With blacks, it's the white devil teaching their precious Nubian queens to covet white men. With whites, it's those evil Jewish men who secretly have control over government and are tricking these, these unsuspecting white women they worship into interracial debauchery. But it's always been as simple as if you try to repress an element of female sexuality, Women will build a resentment towards the people implementing that sexual restriction, especially if the ones placing the restrictions on them are men. If you do this along racial lines, women will perceive the men of their race placing these restrictions as their racial father figure. They will get back at him by sometimes fucking men of the targeted taboo racial group. Weak and desperate, pussy-dependent men of the targeted racial group are usually more than happy to accept the affections of these women most likely knowing, still, deep down, that they're being used and dehumanized in the process. I want to reiterate again that there's absolutely nothing wrong with two people of different races having sexual attractions to each other and acting on that, but I highlight this in order to understand the nuanced way racism, gynocentrism, and misandry all interconnect with each other and how it all surrounds the cultural and racial taboos we place on female and male sexuality. This My Secret Garden excerpt elucidates this phenomena from the perspective of white women that have most likely grown up with a constant potentiation of the racial tribalism inherent to all humans, towards the archetype of the stereotype of the black male rapist. Now, Friday continues uh, in her description of this racist sexual taboo, and uh, the PDF to this is all in the description box, just in case you want to read this uh, book for herself. It's pretty fascinating. She says, quote, All black people are promiscuous, white people think. They're always fucking or they're about to. They reek of sexuality. The most loaded question in the contemporary bedroom after what are you thinking about is, have you ever made it with a black man or woman? Most white women haven't, and for obvious reasons, but in their fantasies they do, and everything that worked against it happening in reality adds mileage to the fantasy. End quote. So again, <clears throat> to reiterate, notice her adherence to the stereotype of the virile black male, 
animalistic and unable to control his sexual urges. Intelligent, individualist-minded black men will see this for exactly what it is, male disposability and dehumanization tinged with a dash of racism for good measure. And again, notice that these female fantasies follow patterns of temporary power exchange and surrender. It's important that we understand this before we tackle our next sexual taboo. In an earlier video, uh, I spoke of the rise and fall of traditionalist patriarchies, which I'm defining now for clarity as any society in which a transactional relationship between men and women exists, where, in general, the male provides goods and services for a chance to sire children and for access to sexual favor from women. I delineated the process that flow from such a civilizational setup as, in summation, a widening of prospective male mates due to this goods for reproduction exchange, which functions as a catalyst for competition between these previously unsuitable men, leading to a maximization of male productive labor and innovation and an explosion of technological advancement and wealth, correlated with increasingly higher demands from women doing what they do naturally, weeding out men for genetic and reproductive fitness. Uh, this process, which I call hypergamy reassertion, leads to a point where, naturally, only the top percentage of these previously unsuitable prospective candidates for breeding are eventually acceptable to women. The explosion in technology and wealth affords women access to political enfranchisement, and the traditionalist patriarchy initiates its own self-destruct sequence where pampered, entitled women exercise increased political clout and wealth against the men who created the conditions with which they acquired it. It's the ultimate and inevitably catastrophic act of biting the hand that feeds them. And in this process, I discuss how the contribution required from women by traditionalist patriarchies, other than reproduction, eventually converges to zero. Again, this is a descriptor for female behavior in the aggregate, and aggregate female behavior can and does enter into conflict with an individual female's hierarchy of needs. A female prostitute, traditionally of the streetwalker variety, puts a price on sex. She puts a fixed price on sex, and a cheap one at that. She acts in direct contradiction to unrestrained inflation of the price of female sexual favor. Now, one would think, according to my theory, that feminism is unlimited ravenous female advocacy. One would think that feminists, seeing the overwhelming evidence that women who sell sex legally and indoors are safer, higher paid, less diseased, and less drug addicted than their streetwalker counterparts, when in the context of decriminalized or legalized regulated prostitution. But one would think feminists would join in advocating for decriminalized or legalized prostitution. It sounds counterintuitive, but there are several key factors at play here. If decriminalized and destigmatized prostitution were to become widespread, the price of sexual favor that is normally, according to the forces of female hypergamy, dictated as a function of the financial capabilities of the men living amongst a given population of women, and not by normal market forces, then an artificially high lower limit for sexual commodities cannot be maintained, and an infinite price for access to sexual favor limited only by how much wealth men are willing to generate for women cannot be maintained. This is the reason why there are certain women in the world, both presently and historically, women not significantly different from women in any other part of the world, whose husbands will deplete small fortunes to please them. We, we can take Mumtaz Mahal, for example, the woman for whom the Taj Mahal was built for. This woman, adorned in her pearls and gilded necklaces, could be dropped in a less affluent or even poverty-stricken part of the world where her feminine wares wouldn't even fetch her a meal for the night. But a rich enough man decided to erect an entire palace in her honor. And as such, feminists and their facilitators, women, exact a punishment. A punishment must be exacted for women who put a ceiling on the price of pussy. Now, on the part of women, this is subconscious. Uh, on the part of feminists, uh, this is targeted. Again, Pussy is a relative commodity. It doesn't have a general price like a bushel of corn or a barrel of oil. Pussy and its value is measured relative only to the amount of wealth prospective males around the woman intent on peddling their product are able and willing to pay for it. And knowing this, feminists, whom exist for the sole purpose of garnering as much advantage for the female sex as possible, cannot afford to allow free market prostitution. What they do want is criminalized prostitution where women of the streetwalker variety are allowed to experience the type of disposability that is normally reserved for the male of the human species. 
I suppose the fact that feminists are just fine with a marginalized and criminalized unregulated prostitution industry on the fringes of society where a woman can disappear into a car, never to be seen again until she's found in a dumpster somewhere. Uh, this being one of the few instances where our, where our society tolerates female disposability. A society, mind you, who expects men to voluntarily die for women. I suppose that to feminists and the vast hordes of everyday average women who vote to keep prostitution illegal, that this is what they deem an appropriate punishment for women that would threaten to open up sex to the unrelenting pressure of free market forces where a fixed price can be ascertained. Uh, perhaps they're scared of the possibility that the commodity women are selling, i.e. pussy, isn't quite as valuable as women and feminists would have men believe. Which requires me to repeat what is really being suppressed here. Decriminalized prostitution isn't being suppressed. Decriminalized and destigmatized prostitution is being suppressed. The distinction is to be found in the realization that taboo is often a much more effective influencing factor on human behavior than the laws of the land are. The process by which the reaction of others spoils normal identity. Stigma has been previously defined in such a manner and we need to understand that the various stigmas surrounding prostitution exist as a means of repressing normal male and female development. Now, let's talk about men. Uh, men have this basic desire for sex, sex with multiple women even. Now, up until contraceptives were developed, it made sense to repress the urge for male polygamy because a man could only take care of so many children. Risking sex with various women meant he ran the risk of impregnating multiple women and spawning multiple children he couldn't realistically provide for. Thus, taboos were put into place. And some of these taboos can, in fact, be much stronger than any legal guideline in place. Now, let's take, for example, the taboo of hitting a woman. What allows a man in a society where, technically, the law states one can physically defend him or herself from an unprovoked physical attack, what compels a man to allow a woman to punch him or kick him or even to spit in his face without hitting back? What compels him not to strike her when he would surely do so if his assailant were male? This is not pacifism, but an adherence to a taboo that supersedes legal etiquette. The taboo is stronger than the law and is a stronger motivator of human behavior than the law. Now, some men don't strike a female assailant back for fear of being legally penalized for doing so, but this only further highlights the power of taboo, since the legal double standard wouldn't exist without the it's never acceptable to hit a woman taboo in the first place. So this is why I emphasize that decriminalized and destigmatized prostitution must be achieved to pose a threat to unlimited hypergamous female instinct. The societal taboos put in place are the ones that must be melted away, since quite clearly, if one is willing to just look around, they can see that our entire civilization is built around prostitution. What is the marital contract if not an exchange of goods for sexual services and reproductive extensions of female sexual goods? Our entire society is one giant prostitution ring dolled up in the mythos of romantic love and other fictions that appeal to a biologically ordained gynocentric religion. Civilization is an organized prostitution racket, and this racket is so ingrained into civilization and our very own biological makeup that we've accepted it and repressed it as an inconvenient truth that cannot be mentioned. Now, when I said that civilization, that the male and female love bond is nothing but glamorized prostitution, most of you, or at least some of you, felt a fleeting, almost subconscious hatred and revulsion toward my voice. For a split second, you hated me. And that's normal. Remember that men going their own way is an uphill fight against preconditions instilled in our psyche so long ago that we couldn't possibly delete it from any instantaneous reaction concerning these matters. Embrace this, recalibrate, and understand that what you felt is the equivalent of that feeling that you have to force yourself to shake whenever a good-looking female teacher is convicted of fucking one of her students. This battle, my friends, will take place in direct opposition to our limbic systems. So again... Civilization, built by men for the sexual favor of women, is organized prostitution. The mechanism by which women have sold their wares? Traditionalism. And traditionalism, as we've talked about before, carried within it the seeds of its own destruction. This form of organized prostitution achieved the massive growth that it did because it allowed for unlimited inflation of the cost of female sexual favor. And this brings us back again to reproductive consciousness. To reiterate, 
ever since we discovered the correlation between reproduction and sex, we've wanted to indulge in promiscuity without paying the reproductive tax that comes with it. And why shouldn't we? I'm 100% in support of this. And now, uh, in this technologically advanced civilization we reside in, we have finally arrived at a point where women have achieved almost complete divorce from reproduction. Now, a brief history lesson, if you'll bear with me. Uh, J.D. Radcliffe wrote in his article, No Father to Guide Them, of Dr. Gregory Pincus, the inventor of the female birth control pill, that his experiments on rabbit parthenogenesis would lead to, quote, the mythical land of the Amazons, a world where women would be self-sufficient, a man's value precisely zero, end quote. Pincus, uh, whom invented one of the most beneficial technologies man has ever produced, was denied tenure at Harvard largely because of this type of Luddite fear-mongering. Now, looking back at this from a present perspective, we can see that men didn't disappear, and men are still indispensable to civilization, to the point where women have to collectively leverage the state to extract male wealth when we're not giving it up voluntarily. And we can expect this same type of Luddite fear-mongering when men finally do break the monopoly women have over reproduction, that is, when they achieve a viable form of ectogenesis. Expect to see a lot of traditionalist conservative types telling us that God sees it as an abomination, or that the ethereal shadowy elites have all spun this into motion from their ivory towers, or expect them to tout the oft-repeated debate-stifling tactic of sadif deflection, i.e., this is exactly what the feminists want, etc., etc. Now, the interesting thing about all that is, is that feminists, some of which include the most strident radical feminist, um, um, Andrea Dorkin in this case, are actually vehemently against the development of an artificial womb for the very same reasons I've mentioned in past videos. Let's take a look at what Andrea Dorkin wrote in her book titled, which is in the link bar, a uh, PDF of, of which is in the link bar, uh, her book titled Right Wing Woman about the development of a means of artificial reproduction. She writes, quote, Reproductive technology is now changing the terms on which men control reproduction. The social control of women who reproduce, the sloppy, messy kind of control, is being replaced by medical control, much more precise, much closer to the efficiency of the brothel model. This changeover, applying the brothel model to reproduction, is just beginning. It is beyond the scope of this book to explore and explain all the new technological intrusions into conception, gestation, and birth, except to say that reproduction will become the kind of commodity that sex is now. Artificial insemination, in vitro fertilization, sex selection, genetic engineering, fetal monitoring, artificial wombs that keep the fetus alive outside of the mother's body, fetal surgery, embryo transplants, and eventual cloning, all these reproductive intrusions make the womb the province of the doctor, not the woman. All make the womb extractable from the woman as a whole person in the same way the vagina or sex is now. Some make the womb extraneous altogether or eventually extraneous. All make reproduction controllable by men on a scale heretofore unimaginable. The issue is not the particular innovation itself, whether it is intrinsically good or bad. The issue is how it will be used in a system in which women are sexual and reproductive commodities already, exploited with lives that are worthless when not serving a specific sexual or reproductive purpose. And later on down in the paragraph, she continues by saying, quote, The ideology of male control of reproduction will stay what it is. The hatred of women will stay what it is. What will change will be the means of expressing both the ideology and the hatred. The means will give conception, gestation, and birth over to men eventually. The whole process of the creation of life will be in their hands. The new means will enable men at last, really, to have women for sex and women for reproduction, both controlled with sadistic precision by men. End quote. Amazing. Now, you see, radical feminists like Dorkin actually understand feminism quite well, a lot better than a lot of these so-called MRAs do. They have no pretenses. They jealously guard female power whilst using a victim narrative to move on male power. This is a power struggle, and feminism is designed, as I've said so many times, as a perpetual female advocacy machine dedicated towards increasing female power perpetually. And this is why the prospect of men obtaining an alternative method of reproduction scares her. She knows, clearly that the power to reproduce is an immense power, and a tactician such as myself understands that it must be obtained eventually. You see, I I'm not going to waste a second of my time debating with feminists, 
and women, and I'm not wasting a second of my time on some college campus arguing with feminists or women and their white knights. Again, there is to be no cooperation between men and women, only mutual exploitation befitting exactly what one would expect from a sexually dimorphic sentient creature where the female operates as a genetic filter for the male. Now, I'm not saying, again, that there's anything wrong with mutual exploitation. I'm just saying that we should never dress it up as cooperation, and we should certainly be cognizant that a sentient ape such as ourself could and will invent himself out of this power struggle. It's a bit like saying that the human species was never meant to invent bombs that could potentially lead to our own extinction, when in fact, we were meant to do precisely that. And why? Well, because we've done it. Because a natural path of human evolution led us there. You see, that's the beauty of the whole thing. Humanity isn't meant to do anything other than what it is we do. So I put forth the idea that I would rather live in a world where men have as much say over who reproduces as women do. Uh, it's hardly some ridiculous idea of eliminating women. Men will want women for sex, they always will, and it will take eons for evolutionary forces to work that out of us, if that's even appropriate according to the evolutionary process. But if you look around closely at what happens when women have control, and, I'm, and I mean complete control over reproduction, uh, and when men have control over it, one, where women have control, leads to stagnation, desperation, violence, and ruin for both men and women, and the other leads to the stars, to less disease, to wealth and prosperity. Now you'll notice that women and the men that serve them will default to when I bring these things up. He just can't get laid or, you know, some other nonsense. But what this is about is the fact that the human species should ask themselves whether or not women have earned the right, now that it is within our capabilities to match their power, but whether or not they have earned the right to a continued place as sole gatekeepers of our species' procreative ability. Now, this may sound like escapism or science fiction or whatever to you, but if you look at it fairly and honestly, what you'll conclude is that this is merely an extrapolation of what men are yearning for in their desire for a safe and effective male birth control pill. Now, we should ask ourselves, why exactly do we want male birth control? Well, because you've heard the stories or perhaps even fell victim to some female forcing you into fatherhood. And how does she do this? She found a way to use your consent to sex to force you into a fatherhood situation that you did not consent to. And I've provided to you in previous videos the statistic of over half of U.S. pregnancies being unplanned. Half. Now, th this constitutes an absolutely massive number of births. And we all know that a whole lot of this was planned, unplanned pregnancy on behalf of the female. And on top of this, we deal with women in an age of multiple countermeasures against pregnancy for women who still shamelessly get pregnant and vote, then go and vote to requisition male wealth for their offspring via the welfare system to the detriment of society as a whole. So you want a male pill because it is plain to see that women are abusing their reproductive power and getting away with it, and men are losing decades of hard work in their children in the process. Now, can you provide to me, then, a good reason that doesn't come out of some Huxleyan conspiracy book on why men shouldn't get to inventing a means of reproduction that women have no sway over? I'm all ears if it isn't some nonsense about the government using it to usher in a new world order, because while you're at it, we should then ban genetic engineering, neonatology, gene therapy, nanotechnology, and bioengineering, and a host of other technologies with a myriad of beneficial applications that the government could one day hypothetically use nefariously against us. As a matter of fact, the government uses guns to control and murder its citizenry every day, and has been doing so since their invention, but the invention of guns didn't lead to any of these Luddite conspiracy theories, and we've managed still to maintain a working civilization despite this. Now, this of course is all very far into the future, but I'm a man of vision, and the topic intrigues me, so I appreciate your listening to my lofty conjecture. But now, uh, we'll talk instead for a while about recent examples of how feminists are consciously aware of this battle of human sexual dimorphism, and how women at large instinctively acknowledge it. The pathologization of the heterosexual male sex drive manifests itself within the drive to regulate and curtail pornography in terms specifically of rape porn, a form of porn that both men and women enjoy and demand. Particularly, groups such as feminists and traditionalist religious groups frame the proliferation of this type of porn not as a natural response to what men and women both wish to consume, but as a deviant manifestation of male sexuality only. 
at least that's how it's framed. The fact is that this aspect of male sexuality exists dualistically with the female predilection for the same rape fantasy as explained earlier in terms of power exchange and sexually dimorphic gendered antagonism. One need only look at this My Secret Garden book mentioned earlier and books like Fifty Shades of Grey, which depict graphic scenes of simulated rape and bondage and which women consume in mass. And yet we see a targeted focus on only internet porn taking shape immediately coinciding with the advent of this technology. This effort is widespread and sustained even by influential political interests, the most recent attempt of which was spearheaded by the UK's David Cameron, who is proposing that internet providers be obligated to provide, according to the article referenced here, which is in the description box, a quote, unavoidable choice as to whether or not they would disable default filters designed to filter out porn. The article states, quote, in the most dramatic step by the government to crack down on the, quote, corroding influence of pornography on childhood, the prime minister will say that all internet users will be contacted by their service providers and, and given an unavoidable choice on whether or not to use filters, end quote. Now, these filters are designed to censor out, quote, extreme pornography, which is subcategorized under the description of both images depicting child sexual abuse and, quote, simulated rape. The purpose of this is twofold. The fact that Cameron categorized a harmful sexual behavior one that damages and exploits children, which is often not a form of de facto consensual sex and inherently non-consensual as per statutory law. The fact that he categorized this with a completely consensual rape simulation that is a natural part of human nature as per the above described sexual dimorphism dynamic is a clear attempt to criminalize a form of sexual expression that he is either misinformed about or openly hostile to. And I suspect the latter, considering his failure to attack female erotica depicting the same visceral rape simulation, which seems to have completely escaped his ire. The man clearly has a problem with the male half expressing his dark sexual desires, but as is often the case, female sexuality is left unmolested. So the purpose of this, we can conclude, is to conflate male rape fantasy with the sexual abuse of children and another less subtle purpose we can deduce from his failure to attack rape literature, like Fifty Shades of Grey, is that the male sexual rape fantasy, while being no more common than the female one, will manifest itself visually more so than in any other media, due to male sexuality being much more visually oriented, hence the attack on internet porn, which is almost exclusively of the visual variety. Now, we'll explore this further in upcoming videos, but for now, I'll finish up with a reading from Vincent B. Klein's Pornography's Effect on the Adult and Child. Now, this is a man who is one of the supposed foremost experts on sexual addiction, and this is what he writes on the topic. And again, uh, this is all in the description box if you want to read the whole text. He says, quote, In my experience as a sexual therapist, any individual who regularly masturbates to pornography is at risk of becoming, in time, a sexual addict, as well as conditioning himself into having a sexual deviancy. A frequent side effect is that it also dramatically reduces their capacity to love. Their sexual side becomes in a sense dehumanized. Many of them developed an alien ego state or dark side whose core is antisocial lust devoid of most values. It makes no difference if one is an eminent physician, attorney, minister, athlete, corporate executive, college president, unskilled laborer, or an average 15-year-old boy. All can be conditioned into deviancy. The process of masturbatory conditioning is inexorable and does not spontaneously remiss. The course of this illness may be slow and is nearly always hidden from view. It is usually a secret part of the man's life, and like a cancer, it keeps growing and spreading. It rarely ever reverses itself, and it is also very difficult to treat and heal." End quote. Two lines in particular highlight something we're going to be exploring in upcoming videos. I'll reiterate, quote, In my experience, as a sexual therapy, any individual who regularly masturbates to pornography is at risk of becoming in time a sexual addict, as well as conditioning himself, himself, into having a sexual deviancy, end quote. And, quote, it makes no difference if one is an eminent physician, attorney, minister, athlete, corporate executive, college president, unskilled laborer, or an average 15-year-old boy. 
all can be conditioned into deviancy, end quote. These statements tell you one thing. Only boys and men can be conditioned into what this charlatan labels as sexual deviancy. More on this later.